shown up yet. So I'm showing some things. Gotcha. Well, yes, we've been, uh, I'll touch a little bit on some of the stuff that he and I proved a couple of years ago um, in this talk. I'm on YouTube. <laughs> Does that mean I'm being recorded? Mm -hmm. All right, so I, I better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I was not aware I'll be recorded. <laughs> and that's a very good beginning to every YouTube video is when the speaker says that. <laughs> okay, shall we get started, Anton? Uh, yes, sure. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, our speaker today is Hiro Tanaka, and he will talk about stable Weinstein geometry through localization. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation, and depending on what time zone you're in, thank you for waking up early or staying up late. Uh, so before I go any further, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is joint work with Oleg Lazarev and Zach Silva. Um, and I, I might talk a little bit, depending on how much time I have, uh, about work that I'm also doing with Jacob Lurie. And I'll also reference a result uh, along the way that is joined with Jung and O as well. But so let, let me uh, start off with some, some, some background. I just want to define one thing. Like, whenever I give a talk, I want to make sure if you didn't know one thing, well, what's the one thing that you ought to take away? So I just want to make sure that I, I mention it, uh, which is just the word Weinstein in the title. So uh, what is a, a Weinstein sector? A lot of this talk is going to be about Weinstein sectors. And if you walk away with nothing else, hopefully you'll feel comfortable hearing this word in future talks if you haven't yet. Uh, so, roughly speaking, so it's a kind of symplectic manifold. So let's fix a symplectic manifold. Let's say capital M with a symplectic form omega. And apologies, I know the seminar is about Poisson geometry as well. Everything will be, in fact, symplectic, not just Poisson. So nothing about the difference between Poisson and symplectic will appear in this talk. Okay. Um, so let's fix a, a symplectic manifold. And a one form, I'll call it lambda. <clears throat> uh, whose derivative is omega. So at this point already, you know that M uh, cannot be a compact manifold unless it's zero dimensional. So we're considering exact symplectic manifold. Um, and a Morse function. and a Riemannian metric so that, oh well, actually no, just a Morse function over case F so that the Liouville flow so what do I mean by the Liouville flow? Once I have a one form omega, a one form lambda I can use the duality provided by the symplectic form to construct a vector field on my symplectic manifold. And so the, the vector field will be called the Liouville vector field. In fact, lambda stands for the word Liouville. And so the flow at the Liouville vector field, let's say, is gradient-like. Um, and let's also assume then, and, um, and finally, We'll assume that M is a finite type meaning M looks like some compact thing times the flow of some compact contact thing times the sleeve of flow. So more accurately, this should be a compact contact thing times a copy of the non-negative real numbers. 
So a picture that you can have in mind is, so maybe M, there's some compact part and some cylindrical neck region to M. Okay. So a symplectic manifold equipped with all this data is called, in this talk, uh, a Weinstein manifold. So this is an assumption, not data. But everything else is data. It's a Weinstein manifold. And, and let me give some motivation as to what in the heck all of this means, because if this is your first time seeing it, it seems completely arbitrary. Um, so maybe one thing I should say is, you know, it's, it's famously known that in symplectic, man, in symplectic geometry, there's no local invariance, and it's very difficult to construct local to global type things. Uh, and I think one thing that the community is, is you know, awakening to is that, uh, you know, local to global depends on what you mean by local and what you mean by two. Um, you know, so what are some sort of local data that you can specify and how do you glue that local data together to make something global? And uh, one of the things that you can ask for um, is this extra data for exact symplectic manifolds. And when you have this extra data called lambda, and when you have this vector field, all of a sudden you can ask, hey, how does this vector field tell me things about the topology or the symplectic geometry of my manifold? And so ideas uh, made famous, as far as I know, by people like uh, Paul Boran and, and Kinsevich. Maybe there are others. I apologize for my ignorance. Let's say that you have this two-dimensional manifold, possibly with boundary. So in black solid here, I've drawn a boundary. And I'm also going to draw in green a particular locus inside of my two-manifold with boundary. This two-manifold is, is non-compact in the dot dashed directions. And so, you know, this is, uh, let's say that we give this some symplectic structure. And once we equip it with a one form, whose derivative is omega, let's look at the Liouville vector field. And I'm going to be interested in symplectic manifolds whose Liouville vector fields might look something like this. So it's, it's pointing outwards along the boundary. And in particular, I can ask for some sort of a non-escaping set under this purple flow. And sometimes that's called the skeleton or the core of this symplectic manifold with a choice of lambda. And I've drawn the core here. It's some singular manifold, right? It's, it's a trivalent graph. And uh, one thing that uh, has now been proven is that it turns out that invariance of this manifold, for example, can be recovered by understanding local invariance defined locally on the skeleton. And by understanding how you can glue this graph together from local pieces, like this trivalent vertex and gluing these trivalent vertices along this edge, by understanding how to glue this essentially combinatorial object together, we can actually recover global invariance of this entire symplectic manifold using the local pieces of this skeleton. So again, the question here was, you know, what do we mean by local? Right? We're not taking an arbitrary open cover of this symplectic manifold. Rather, we're using lambda to realize that there's a notion of locality that we can define using lambda. Right? So, as I said before, local to global depends on what you mean by local, and also depends on what you mean by two. Right? When we say local to global, for example, for Mayavia torus in homology, well, you better know what long exact sequences of homology groups are, or you have no idea how to implement the two, right, to use the Mayavia torus sequence. And likewise here, the, the two process, right? how do you go from local to global, it depends on what kind of invariance you're looking at. And if your invariant is something like the wrapped Fukaya category, it turns out that the two process is computing a particular co-limit of categories. OK, so let me just say that so that this lambda um, gives you a hope of articulating what local might mean if you're interested in local to global things. That's how I am looking at this data of lambda. There's other kinds of local to global principles. Uh, for example, as made famous by Seidel, in case your symplectic manifolds might be compact but have meaningful divisors, they also exist, but I'm not touching on that today. So what's the deal with asking then that the uh, Lilo vector field is somehow compatible with something that looks like a gradient vector field for F? Well, that's to be able to actually, you know, you, you should ask Alan that question, but uh, I'll tell you my interpretation of it. 
That's to be able to bring in classical tools of local to global constructions and smooth topology as opposed to symplectic topology. All of a sudden, when you have a Morse function, and let's say that you also have a Riemannian metric, for example, you know that you can construct your manifold out of handles, or sometimes called cells, just like we'd build topological spaces out of cells if they're CW. And so the fact that there's some sort of function that's compatible with this vector field uh, tells you that, in fact, there's a way in which you can think of your Weinstein manifold as built out of symplectic handle bodies. Okay. So um, that's an even nicer, so you know, this gives you an idea of what local might mean, and this even gives you a, a geometric idea of what local to global might mean. You make the entire symplectic manifold by attaching symplectic cells together, or symplectic handles together. So if there's one thing that you remember, uh, maybe you know, Weinstein manifolds are the kinds of symplectic things that you can construct by creating cell decompositions, just like you would with classical differential topology. So that's how I think of these things. So what are sectors? Uh, so if N has uh, possibly corners, and these data respect the corners in a way that I'm not going to articulate, then that N will be called a Weinstein sector. In particular, a kind of Weinstein sector is a Weinstein manifold. If your sector has no corners, it's a Weinstein manifold. Uh, oh, I should have said one thing, I apologize. So here I drew something compact. Um, so that, that's the K that I've drawn. So everything in this region is K. So let me draw it in purple. So everything in here, in the purple, um, oh, actually, I, 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 never mind. Let, let me not go there. Uh, sorry. There's a version of this where you don't do the dot, dot, dot directions. You compactify here, and then you extend along the purple flow. And so this would be a sector. It has a boundary called this purple thing. And let me draw the contact region K in red now. So this is the capital K in this notation. And when you flow along now this purple vector field, that's this part. That's the leeward flow. Okay, so, so this is an example of a sector. It has boundary, has a non-compact boundary once I extend, and the manifold itself, of course, is non-compact. But somehow the skeleton, the green thing, is very, very compact. Okay. All right, so that's a, that's a, you know, a quick introduction to Weinstein sectors. Okay. Um, and so in the areas that I work in, I, I would say right now that there's two parallel storylines that are happening in, 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 uh, <clears throat> in the world of Weinstein sectors that I'm involved in. So there's two storylines, and one of them is uh, constructing uh, more powerful invariants of Weinstein sectors. I mean, in some sense, that's like all of mathematics. Uh, <laughs> like we try to construct invariants of things so that we can detect what they are. And uh, so from a pure symplectic geometry point of view, you know, that, that's motivated. But uh, it's also motivated from mirror symmetry. It's, it's expected, and in many cases known, that a lot of these invariants reflect invariants from algebraic geometry. And of course, that's one of the strong uh, powers of homological mirror symmetry. So just to give you an example of the kind of things that I'm talking about, so one powerful invariant of Weinstein sectors that's pretty famous is the wrapped Fukaya category. And in this talk, I'll call that W of M. So M refers to my Weinstein sector. I've, uh, I'm emitting the data of the lambda and the function. And uh, you know this is due to people like Abu Zaid and Seidel. Abu Zaid has another definition, and uh, Ganacha, Pardin, and Shenda, following ideas proposed by Abu Zaid and Seidel, also give a definition of the rapture kind category. Okay. Um, there's other invariants. Um, so, for example, there is the uh, microlocal category. 
the micro local sheaf category. It's fancy sh of m. And the construction of this is very recent, I think in the last year and a half. I think the paper came out during the pandemic. Uh, it's due to Nadler and Schemmer. And another one that I'd like to highlight is you can construct a category out of Lagrangian cobordisms, where the objects are Lagrangians, just like in the Rapfukai category, but the morphisms are very particular types of cobordisms. Uh, so this infinity category was defined by myself and Nadler, maybe back in like 2011 or something. Uh, related work, although they don't define this in a categorically robust way, they kind of get at the K-theory of the category, not the category itself, uh, but certainly work of Beren and Cornea, I think, is known to be quite influential in studying Lagrangian cobordisms. Okay, so that's one storyline that's been happening. And let me just say that, uh, what do I mean by more powerful? So I think classically it's fair to say that, uh, let, me, let me focus in on the, on the Fukaya category side of things, most Fukaya categorical invariants are focused on making certain kinds of chain complexes. Right? They're very classically linear in that sense. So things like vector spaces that are graded with differentials or abelian groups that are graded with differentials. Right? It's, it's very chain complexy. Um, so let me write that down. So this is, these are invariants that really depend on, on chain complexes. Like, you know, more important than the fact that it's an A-infinity category is that for a pair of Lagrangians, you get a chain complex. That's somehow like the important thing. That's the kind of invariant that this is. So what do I mean by more powerful? Well, um, you know, if you do a lot of homotopy theory, you're, you are told and you learn that there are far more powerful linear invariants than chain complexes, and those are spectra. And so, for example, this microlocal sheaf category and the category of Lagrangian cobordisms, these are not things that produce chain complexes out of pairs of Lagrangians, but spectra. And every chain complex is an example of a spectra, but not vice versa. Um, if you like, you know, chain complexes, you can make an analogy, they're like Q vector spaces, where spectra are like Z modules. Z modules have far richer invariants and far more intricate algebras. Okay. And in fact, uh, this is probably something that I won't have time to get to, but uh, I think it's work in progress to actually make the rad category whose coefficients aren't in chain complexes, but uh, are in spectra. And so that's work in progress of, of many people um, so I apologize for the small font, but Abu Zaid, uh, Blumberg, Kra, that's Tomas Kra, and, and Timothy Large are certainly names that belong on this list. And there's also a joint work of myself and Jacob Lurie that is in progress as well. So that's definitely an active storyline. Like a lot of, I think, uh, wonderful ideas are going into creating more powerful invariants of Weinstein sectors. But there's another kind of forgotten tale that uh, I'd like to talk about today, uh, which is actually uh, constructing a good infinity category of Weinstein sectors. Hello? Hello, who is it? Okay, so you know, it's constructing good infinity categories of, of Weinstein sectors. Um, so I'm aware that like a lot of the audience might not be huge into infinity categories. So before I, I get too deep into that, l let me motivate it by stating some theorems, some results. Um, or actually, let, let me give some motivation. And so this somehow is looking ahead. Let's assume that all this can be done. Uh, like for example, the Rafukaya category over spectra, that's not done yet, right? But let's assume that all these things are being set up. So this is the next step. So motivation. So let's fix some uh, Weinstein sector called M uh, and an invariant. And let's call it, for example, the rapt Fukaya category of M because that's the one that might be most familiar. For now, it's just an invariant. So here's some natural question. Question. If there exists a group action on capital M, is there an induced action on the invariant? 
Hiro? Yes. Uh, could you briefly recall us what is, uh, like, in, in a couple of words, what is W of M? Yes, it's the Rep Fukaya category of M. Do you want me to say more? Uh, probably. Uh, at least it gives us some intuition, right? If you ask any question about it, then it's difficult. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Absolutely. So this is a category. So let me give a little bit of background on this. So the Rep Fukaya category of M is a category. A lot of people will say it's an A infinity category, that's more accurate, but that's not going to matter too much for the intuition that I want to present. And it's a category that captures a lot of the symplectic geometry of M, so let me be a little more specific. So what are the objects? The objects are certain Lagrangian submanifolds. That I'll call L inside of M. Now, because M is non-compact, as in these two examples, right, there's all kinds of crazy submanifolds that can live inside of these. So that's one reason that I use the word certain. The kinds of Lagrangian submanifolds that we're going to consider are those that actually have some pretty good control over infinity and in that they look cylindrical with respect to the Lego flow. So regardless, so in fact, all of their behavior is conical near infinity. So in fact, all of the topologically interesting things about the Lagrangian will happen in a compact region. So those are the kinds of objects that we consider. Uh, of course, Lagrangians are half-dimensional submanifolds on which the symplectic form vanishes. Uh, because we also have the data of lambda on M, so remember that we have this one form called lambda that we fixed on M, uh, we can also demand that uh, when we restrict this lambda to this half-dimensional submanifold, it happens to be exact. Okay, so that's the kinds of Lagrangian submanifolds that I'll be thinking about. And one of the morphisms. So what is a category? A category is a way to assign an invariant to every pair of objects. Right? And so what is the invariant that we assign to a pair of Lagrangians called L0 and L1? Well, roughly speaking, it's going to be a, a chain complex. So to tell you what a chain complex is, I need to give you a graded abelian group, and I need to give you a differential. So it's a little bit tricky in the wrapped setting, but let me tell you how to do it. So uh, let me work over Z mod 2Z coefficients. So it's going to be uh, you know, generated by a bunch of Z mod 2Zs with a particular grading that I'm not going to specify today. And let me tell you what the generators of this Z mod 2Z module is. What we're going to take is we're going to take intersection points between L1 and a certain flow for time n of L0. So this is flow sub n of L0, and where n is, say, all uh, positive integers, non-negative integers. So, so let, let me draw a picture of what's going on, and I need to tell you what kind of flow. Um, so for example, here I might have um, this green Lagrangian. I'm not going to draw what it specifically does in the interior because that's not going to matter too much. And let's say that I also have a red Lagrangian, which I'll draw like this. Okay. So here's a red and a green, and I'll draw the red as L0, and the green one will be L1. So in the classical wrapped Fukaya category, you just take two Lagrangians and you'd compute their intersections, right? And then you'd define a differential that I'll get to later. The point is, there's no flow in the definition of morphisms in the usual Fukaya category. The adjective wrapped comes in. Where's the wrapped? Well, W stands for wrapped. The adjective wrapped comes in for the following reason. Uh, what we do is we first choose some Hamiltonian, some sort of function, that's linear near infinity. And we flow L0 with respect to the Hamiltonian vector field. Okay, So that's the flow. The flow is with respect to a chosen Hamiltonian vector field. And if I flow for time 1, this red vector, this red Lagrangian, is going to, say, turn into some, I don't know, this purple Lagrangian. So all of a sudden, you can see that I have a new intersection point. So I count that as a generator. So that's after time 1. Well, now I'm going to also flow it for time 2. And so when I flow it for time 2, it might wrap around another time. 
And so now I actually have two new intersection points, not just one. And so I make some, some directed limit, some co-limit, some filtered co-limit of a bunch of these intersection complexes, and it's indexed by the time n flow. Okay, so for every n, I flow for time n, and I compute this intersection complex each time. And so that's how this thing is generated. And the differential here, uh, let me not get too specific, but you count uh, holomorphic strips between the intersection points. OK. And then, um, so you know, those are the objects, the Lagrangians. And the invariance for every pair of Lagrangians is this. It's this chain complex. And of course, any category also has you know, multiplicative information called composition, but uh, maybe I won't get into that. Composition is constructed by counting holomorphic disks with certain punctures along the boundary. Uh, Anton, is that a sufficient uh, kind of crash course? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay, beautiful, uh, awesome. And again, everybody, please feel free to ask questions because uh, I'm new to this seminar and I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, so let's say that we have a group action on M, right, that respects whatever relevant structures you want to be respected. Then the question is, is there an induced action on the wrapped Fukaya category of M on this invariant? And uh, yes. Well, my apologies. I have one more question. Uh, yes. Respect all the structures, does it mean that the group action commutes is a flow? That right? is a fantastic that's a that's a fantastic question. So uh, let me answer that now. I was gonna get to that later. But let me answer that now. Um, so the Yeah, so let me just say what a group element ought to do. So that means that uh, you know, if I have a group G and if I have a group element lowercase g, so you know, G is going to define some map from M to itself. And the thing that G should satisfy is that if I pull back lambda, it should equal lambda up to some compactly supported exact thing. And so one of the weird things about this definition, actually, and one thing that I'll emphasize later, is I'm actually going to discard the information of f. G doesn't need to respect f. It only needs to respect lambda up to compactly supported exact one form. And you can check that this is a, you know, a, you know it's closed under composition. This you know, is a, is a well-defined notion of what it means to be a group action on M, or a well-defined class of actions on M. Okay, so, so, so in fact, uh, it does not quite commute it is slow, but uh, still, in some way, up to compactly supported things, it commutes, right? Something exactly, like exactly. It commutes with the flow at infinity. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. No, no. Thank you for the questions. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, and of course, this is a question you can ask for any invariant. It doesn't just need to be wrapped things. It could be for the microlocal sheaf category, Lagrangian cobordisms, spectral wrapped category. And if there's any justice in the world, and if there's anything natural about your invariant, the answer ought to be yes. So the answer ought to be yes. And uh, one annoying thing is, even if the answer is yes, it looks like you'd have to use completely different kinds of tools to answer in the affirmative for each of these invariants. Right? As defined, whatever you do to verify this for the wrapped category, you better have something to do with holomorphic strips. If you want to, you know, prove that the answer is yes for microlocal sheaves, you better use techniques that have to do with microlocal sheaves. So Lagrangian cobordisms, same thing. Okay. And so there's not just the question of, hey, do we know the answer to this question? There's also the answer of, can we prove the answer to this question in some simple way? So you start seeing how, like, regardless of invariance, maybe we want a good framework of Weinstein sectors. Right. Here's some other questions. Question. Um, so let's let you know home from M to N uh, be the space of maps between sectors. So let me say what I mean by that. So what is a map of of sectors? First of all, it's a smooth map. So f is c infinity. 
Uh, we demand that f is a co-dimension zero embedding. We demand that f is proper. And finally, we demand this condition. Oh, f might be a bad choice of letters. I'll write g. Apologies. And so when I pull back the symplectic, oh, sorry, the Liouville form on n, I want to recover the Liouville form on m up to some compactly supported exact function. Sorry, exact one. Beautiful. So the, the question that you can ask is, um, is there a continuous map from these embedding spaces to the space of morphisms between your invariants? That's a question you could ask. So let me box off the question. Right, so that's a very, very natural question. For example, when you have an invariance of things, oftentimes they don't just tell you when two things are different. They might tell you the relationship between two different things. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a classical problem in all of geometry, like can you compute the space of well-behaved maps between two objects? And so having a continuous map like this might help you compute the homotopy groups of these things or construct constraints on them. So hopefully these are pretty well-motivated questions. And finally, here's another question. If M is a sector with a multiplicative structure, so maybe it's something like a group object or an algebra object for sectors, does this invariant inherit a multiplicative structure? Uh, so just to give you an idea, like on the algebraic geometry side, sheaves, you can tensor together sheaves, right? It's not obvious that you can tensor together Lagrangians. What does that even mean? But maybe N itself comes with some extra structure. Like, for example, cotangent bundles have fiber-wise addition. And so, you know, it has this kind of multiplicative structure where you can take M times N and map it to M in some meaningful way. Then will the wrapped category also exhibit this kind of multiplicative structure where suddenly this defines a way to tensor product Lagrangians together? So that's another very natural kind of question to ask. Okay. So uh, let me answer all of these questions in the affirmative. So that, that will be one of the main results. Uh, and just, by the way, just, just another kind of, you know, corollary of, of this question. Um, you know, answering this question in the affirmative puts restrictions on what kind of groups can act on M, right? Um, like, if you can compute, you know, let's, if you replace M by its invariant, then you can put constraints on what kinds of group actions exist on this very algebraic invariant. Suddenly, that turns into geometric information. Right? Okay. So here's the theorems I'd like to talk about. So this is uh, Oleg Lazarev, Zach Silvan, and myself. <clears throat> so uh, suppose that uh, blackboard bold W is an invariant of uh, sectors satisfying the following. So first, if G is a map of sectors uh, such that it actually respects the one forms on the nose, then we actually have an induced map of invariance. So this is part of the hypothesis. Uh, second, let's suppose that this is a functorial in that it respects composition. Third and fourth. So these are somehow the most important assumptions that we make. So let's assume 
uh, that um, there's just a natural equivalence between the invariant that you associate to M and the invariant that you associate to M but made thicker by one complex dimension. So this is M direct producted with the cotangent bundle of a unit interval. Let me motivate this, which is that uh, this is a property known to hold uh, for all of these invariants that I talked about earlier. Um, sorry, here there, there, there is a question in the chart. I don't know whether you can see the chart. Ah, uh, yes, I can see it. Is some multiplicative structure something like a symplectic grouplet structure? I yes, um, that would be an example, Alan. In fact, um, so yes, that. So let me just say yes, but let me also make a comment. One of the things that uh, Oleg, Zach, and I have discovered actually is that uh, there's actually, you know, commutative um, Weinstein sectors out there that we can prove have multiplicative structures, but we cannot prove come from a symplectic groupoid. And so there, there's actually a question about, um, you know, are all multiplicative things, um, do all multiplicative things arise from a symplectic groupoid structure? So that, that's an open question that I don't know the answer to. But Alan, what you write is is probably the most fertile source of multiplicative structures. Yes. Okay. So condition number three is is, is motivated because we know that there is a natural equivalence in that uh, you know these invariants are insensitive to stabilizing M. So when we thicken M by the cotangent bundle of an interval, we call that a stabilization of M. And these invariants are known to be invariant under this process. And there's a natural other class of uh, equivalences of M that uh, these invariants are known to be invariant under. So whenever G admits an inverse up to isotopy, in other words, you know, there exists some other map such that GH is isotopic to the identity, and HG is isotopic to the identity through these kinds of maps. Then the induced map, G lower star, is an equivalence. And so these are also properties, um, this is also a property known to hold for all of these invariants. Okay, so this is just natural hypotheses known to hold in all the interesting invariants that we've got. Uh, then, um, W induces a continuous map from the space of embeddings but stabilized. So you can look at the space not just of sectorial maps from M to N, but sectorial maps from M stabilized to N stabilized okay so this is the space of stable embeddings from M to N to the space of maps between the invariants so I, I'd like to emphasize some things about this theorem so first, none of the hypotheses have anything to do with the topology of embedding spaces. There's no hypothesis that G behaves continuously. Uh, these are just yes or no discrete questions. Like, you know, G, if G is known to satisfy some property, then is there a discrete question you can answer about G lower star? That's what property four is. And so one, two, three, and four actually are properties all known to be satisfied, like I said, by these important invariants. And now for free, we can say that in fact, all of these important invariants induces a continuous map between embedding spaces. So this answers question two in the affirmative. And the wonderful thing about that is, as I said before, if I wanted to prove something like continuous dependence of these invariants, I need to use different techniques for each kind of invariant. Like I would need to be able to say something about the space of holomorphic disks, or the space of microlocal sheaves, or the space of Lagrangian cobordisms. This completely avoids that, so long as all you need to verify is composition and properties. 
So you avoid any kind of really messy moduli space arguments. So that's a super powerful uh, content of this theorem. Okay, so that, that's one thing. Then there is a Poisson connection to this stock. Okay, beautiful, wonderful. All right, but there's a second part of this theorem. Okay. So moreover, oh, sorry, so which question am I answering? So, so th that answers the, the stable version of this question. So I didn't answer the question in the affirmative for just the honest space of maps. I only answered the question for the stable space of maps. In other words, when I thicken M and M. So moreover, uh, these maps respect composition. So we have a bunch of these maps, right? And of course, you know, if I had another uh, sector called, you know, uh, I don't know, M prime, then I could map M prime into M and M into N, and likewise with the invariants. And uh, these maps respect that composition. So in other words, as, as a corollary, whenever we have a group action on M, we have a group action on the invariant associated to M. Again, this is true for all invariants satisfying these hypotheses. And the most powerful invariants we have are known to satisfy these hypotheses. Okay. Uh, and so, again, the, the way that this corollary goes is, you know, if we have a group action of G on M, that means that we have, you know, a group map from G into the space of self maps of M, and this here gives me, first part of the theorem gives me, map from here to here, and the second part telling me that these maps respect to composition tells me that this is a group map, or a map of monoids, and hence a group map onto its image. Okay, so this, this answer is uh, now question one. This is answer. Um, and so I'm looking out for time, uh, so um, let me just promise that question three about multiplicative structures is also answered in the affirmative, but let, let me uh, get into how this, like a more precise statement of this theorem and how it's actually proven. But I, I hear some audio, is there a question? Yeah, sorry, yeah, I have one more question. So as you, uh, as you put it here for G actions, right? Suppose you have a continuous map from end to end, you can then probably induce a map of stabilizations, right? Just by adding a trivial identity on, uh, uh, on the cotangents, right, of uh, arbitrary power of cotangent. And, and so how, how is it, what, um, so, so you, in, in this way, you also in some way can map continuous maps from end to end to, to those homomorphisms of invariants, but is it like bad in some way, or what, what's wrong with it, or what's good with it? There, there's nothing wrong except, so set theoretically, you're absolutely right, with, with a caveat that I'll get into later, but set theoretically, you're absolutely right, but have you proven that that assignment is continuous and respects compositions? And and actually, th this is a this is a more subtle question. Um, so, so does that first address uh, the question that you raised, Anton? Um, to some extent, uh, okay. But you, you you're saying it's going to be continuous and respect compositions for stabilization, but not necessarily for the uh, original maps before you stabilize them. That yeah. So I'm not yes. So. That's the, that's the extent of the theorem. I'm not saying that it won't be continuous and composition respecting, but the theorem does not guarantee that. Uh, sorry, one more thing. There is uh, another question on the chat. Just yes, from Ezra, I saw, I saw. Yes, uh, so by equivalence, do you mean equivalence or weak equivalence? Uh, so in, in part three, that's a great question, Ezra. It depends on what these invariants are. If these invariants are topological spaces, I mean weak equivalence. Um, if these are objects of some infinity category, then I mean equivalence in, the, in that in infinity category. And here, uh, if your invariants are categorical, then I mean Dwyer Kahn equivalence. So for example, it should be essentially surjective on objects and it should induce a weak homotopy equivalence on mapping spaces. Right, so 
So really a weak equivalence. I mean, you'd need some vibrancy, I guess, to actually extract then from that a homotopy inverse, something like that. Right. To extract the homotopy inverse, you'd yeah. either need to localize or vibrancy. And, and what I always do is localize. You localize. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Right. Ah, right, right, right. So let me just make a remark. So there's actually a theorem uh, of me and Jungen that actually says, um, so, you know, um, there exists a composition respecting continuous map from automorphisms of any uh, sector to automorphisms, auto, automorphisms of the wrapped Foucault category. So this is no longer uh, bolded, this is the wrapped Foucault category, it's not every invariant. So this is in a paper on the archive from a couple of years ago. So Anton, maybe this also addresses the question. So, you know, it, it is known that without stabilizing, so this is not stabilized, that, you know, things like wrapped Foucault categories, they, they have continuous actions of these things. Um, so this theorem doesn't say anything about these things not existing, they, they do exist. But I think one of the frustrations for me was like, this just recovered, required a ton of geometric constructions in, in you know, involving homomorphic disks and, and bundles, yada yada. And in fact, we actually made a mistake that, that we're still correcting. It's taken us like nine months to write up the correction to the mistake having to do with uh, the maximum principle being applicable in this setting. But you know, it, it's, it's annoying because now let's say that I want to work with Lagrangian cobordisms or with microlocal sheets. So, so this is part of what motivated, I think, this, this thing. So, so Anton, does that answer your, your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, let, let me actually say that um, I am I'm being a homotopy theorist. Um, so, like, like this home, um, when W is something like an A-infinity category, it's not easy to honestly construct a space. This is more like a simplicial complex type thing. It's more combinatorially defined. And you can also convert this into something more combinatorially defined. So, Rigorously speaking, this is actually going to be a map of simplicial sets. And rigorously speaking, they respect composition up to A infinity coherences. So this is actually a map of, of A infinity algebras and simplicial sets, but I don't think that contributes anything to the heuristic understanding of the content. I think as written, these are the most understandable, uh, albeit imprecise forms of these theorems. And the same remarks apply to both the corollary and the theorem. Uh, in fact, it, it would be impossible to prove these theorems using groups on the nose, because you know this isn't even well defined as a group isomorphism class on the right hand side. Okay. All right. Um, so le let me try to say uh, how this is proven. So how to prove. And this is one of the more formal results that I've ever talked about, so I apologize for the amount of categories that I'm going to enter. Okay, so let's just make some definitions. So let's let wine strict be the category in the usual sense. There's nothing infinity about this. So the objects are uh, Weinstein sectors. where we, we forget the data of the Morse function. So roughly speaking, you should actually, if you know the terminology, you should think of these as legal sectors that admit Weinstein structures. But that's okay, let's just call them Weinstein sectors and we forget that. And it will be the category of those morphisms, so whose morphisms are the things G that we had before, such that G actually strictly respects the lambda structure. So there's no DHs here. So this is indeed a category. Um, and so let, let me, what's the uh, subscript strict here? Uh, such G are called strict. So this is to remind us that we're looking at strict morphisms. Okay. And now we can take the stabilization of this, which I'll denote by a diamond. Uh, this will be the increasing union So given a Weinstein sector called M, 
I can always stabilize it. Okay, and so I can keep going and keep going. So this is a sequence of functors from a category to itself. And I can take the increasing union of the sequence of categories called a colonet. Right? Um, so maybe this is for Ezra, but for people worried about this kind of thing, uh, these are all cofibrations. They're all injective in an appropriate sense. So the honest colimit is the homotopy colimit, if you like. Okay. So this is again just a category, and, and you know, you can think of the objects as just stabilized sectors, where you vaguely remember uh, how many times you've stabilized or destabilized. And the morphisms are these things, g, but on the stabilizations. Okay. And then finally. Let's let this collection I'll denote those morphisms that admit inverses up to isotopy. So this is the same condition that we saw before. It's those G's that emit H's such that GH is isotopic to the identity and HG is isotopic to the identity. Um, then the main content of our theorem actually, it, it begins with a very formal object. So we have this category of stabilized Weinstein sectors. And what we can do is perform a completely formal process called localization. And I think nowadays, most localizations are infinity categorical. So this is the least geometric thing to appear in this talk. So let me give some idea of what it is. Uh, the word localization, of course, comes from, from commutative algebra. Like if I have some ring R, and I want to invert some element of it, some element called t, I can adjoin t inverse, and that would be called the localization of r with respect to this variable t. Right? And this is the exact same thing. So you can start with a category, and you might have some, some morphism, and you might wish, oh, I wish that g were invertible. And so this localization is the kind of thing that you get by formally adjoining an inverse, just like you formally adjoin a multiplicative inverse here. So here you formally adjoin a compositional inverse. And so I think, like you know, before um, before the '80s, I, I don't know, like you know, before Bousfield and and you know Kahn and Dwyer and all those people, I think the only way that we knew how to do this was you know to, to remain in the world of just categories, you know, with, with actual compositions and you know, sets of morphisms. Um, but now we you know know how to do this in a slightly more natural way. It turns out that when we start formally inserting inverses. We also want to formally insert the data of how the composition of this formal inverse should be homotopic to the identity. And so when we insert this formal inverse, we also actually need to start formally inverting data of homotopies. And now you can imagine that when we start composing G inverse with other random morphisms that already existed and closing this under compositions, you actually start needing to insert higher and higher homotopies as well to ensure the coherences of compositions. And so this is actually why infinity categories come into the picture. When we just want to do this very formal process, you cannot escape the infinity. The infinity just means you have homotopies and higher and higher homotopies. You just cannot, cannot escape it. And so this is a completely formal process. We're, we're supposed to have no idea what this is as a concrete object. It just has like nice properties, but we have no idea what it looks like. And so the actual theorem that, that we prove again, Lazarus, Sylvan, and me is that uh, there's an equivalence of infinity categories between this completely abstract localization that we're not supposed to have any handle over it's the thing that we get by inverting these equivalences. Okay. And uh, 
the infinity category of stabilized sectors with home equal to the space of stabilized embedding. So this, this right-hand side is the geometric thing that, you know, is what we want and we know what it looks like. And the theorem is that this completely formal thing is actually equivalent to this very geometric thing. And uh, this is uh, one of the more technical proofs that I've ever done in my life. Uh, but it's pretty awesome. Okay, so are there any questions so far? In, in, in the last 10 minutes, I think I can at least try to say why this first theorem is actually a corollary of this theorem. Maybe, maybe I'll number this. So that's the first theorem, that's the second theorem. So are, are there any questions? Oh, oh, oh hi, it's Maxim Kansevich here. Yeah. Actually, hi. I thought about this stuff for a long time. Uh, do you have an idea what will be home from point to point? Is it a... Uh, that is such second? a good... Oh my god, Maxim, oh my god. Is uh, it a group? Is it a group first? Is any limit invertible or... yeah? Uh, no, uh, so home from a point to point here is not group-like. It, it, it's an E-infinity space, yeah. so it'll be commutative, but it's not group-like. And, and, and you see this because uh, you apply the rad fukaya category functor. There, there's embeddings of T star dn into itself that send the cotangent fiber to a non-generating object. So there's self-embeddings of T star dn that clearly aren't equivalences. So it's not a group. There's no offense, Maxine, but there's no, nothing more intimidating than you telling me that you've thought about something for a long time and it has to do with one of my theorems. I'm like, oh, what if I'm wrong? Okay. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, so let me, let me explain now how, how to prove theorem one from theorem two. So all this uh, stuff, assumptions one and two, it's just to say that um, this invariant called W defines a functor from this ordinary category of strict things to um, whatever, category, whatever infinity category your invariant lives in. So this is where your invariant takes values. So for example, if bold W is usual W, the rat fukai category, this would be the infinity category of the infinity categories. Okay. In fact, this proof will show that these hypotheses can be weakened, but let me not go into that. So that's what hypotheses one of two, one and two, theorem one says. So uh, just to remind you, line strict was, was this guy. It's the category of Weinstein sectors without the F, and with strict morphisms. Okay? Now we define this diamond thing to be this colimit. So in fact, assumption three here, which tells you that there's an equivalence between the invariant of M and the invariant of a special of the stabilization, says that W induces a functor from the stabilization. Okay? And then number four says the W factors. So uh, what number four tells me is that anything called lowercase g that lives in the class of equivalences, right, so anything, any lowercase g that's in the class of equivalences, uh, you know, is sent to an equivalence in the infinity category. And so what are localizations good for? By the universal property of localizations, we then know that W has to factor through the localization. And so that's the end of the proof. It's frustratingly easy. And so now, how do you finish the proof? You use this equivalence. So by theorem two, we get the actual infinity category of sectors that are stabilized 
And so composing these two functors, you get what you want. Because once you have a functor, well, here's an infinity category, here's an infinity category. So sp morphism spaces here are sent continuously to morphism spaces here. Done. Okay. And because it's a functor, it means it respects composition, at least up to A infinity coherences. So that, that's the proof of theorem 1 using theorem 2. Um, and let me just say that this proof method, as far as I know, like um, how can you try to push it to the um, you know, non-stabilized case? I don't know. Um, I, I need to stabilize because of the details of this proof. Uh, I see a question in the chat. Um, oh, it's, okay. As, okay, it's beautiful. Not exactly yes. a question. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. thank you. No, thank you. No, that's actually super helpful for me because I need to know the history. Um, so let me, um, so I think I have three minutes. So let me actually say a little bit more because I said that I might not get to question three, but, but maybe I'll, I'll have to, a chance to now. Um, or actually, let me actually say, no, actually, let, let me talk about this theorem alone, actually, because I, I actually need to say something to address something that uh, Anton brought up way earlier which is, wait, but can't you always like stabilize morphisms anyway? And so it turns out that there's something really, really non-trivial about this. So no. So let's suppose that G is one of those morphisms that, that aren't strict, but are strict up to something compactly supported. So G is a map from M to N. And now let's consider G stabilized. I'm going to reveal that I've been lying to you. So this is a map from the stabilized M to stabilized N called G times identity. So it sends X comma T comma tau to just G of X comma T comma tau. T and tau being coordinates for the cotangent bundle. So here's an issue. The stabilized map, if I pull back the form on stabilized N, I do and get, indeed get the form on stabilized N plus some dH, but this H is no longer compactly supported. It's constant in the t star 0, 1 direction. So as a result, if there's any point on n where this doesn't vanish, then it doesn't vanish in all the non-compact directions of t star 0, 1. Um, so that's actually one reason that we, we like to begin with strict things. When h is 0, then this is 0, so we're good. Like strict morphisms actually stabilize. Arbitrary morphisms don't. So one of the things also that I won't get to talk about today is Constructing this infinity category of stabilized sectors is actually a pain in the backside because this, this set of stabilized morphisms is actually not well defined as a set. You actually need to more cleverly define it using, you can think of it in multiple ways, but a clever co-limit of spaces or by defining a very clever infinity category, which is what we have to do. So let me just say that even defining the right-hand side here was a completely non-trivial task. So, so this is one of the more technical things I've ever done in my life. Um, and so uh, let, let me say something about multiplicative stuff. And Maxine, if you can stick around, I'd love to talk to you actually about this category because it has some awesome properties that I'd love to run by you. But So now let me just, just, just talk about multiplicative stuff um, in the last 60 seconds. So uh, a remark. Another natural class of morphisms uh, that leave W invariant uh, is attachments of uh, subcritical cells. So there are certain morphisms where you can include M into N, and this realizes N as obtained from M by attaching cells of dimension less than or equal to N minus 1. 
And let me just say that you can also localize this further with respect to those kinds of morphisms. And that's how I produce with uh, Oleg and Zek a bunch of commutative algebra objects on the left-hand side that are not known to arise yet from symplectic quadruploids. But anyway, so everything here was about localizations allowing us to prove some awesome, awesome results. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Thank you. Thanks, Hiro. Um, Thank you. I think Eckerd has a question. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe I ask a question again, Maximia. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, do I understand correctly this adding subcritical cells doesn't change Foucault categories or whatever, yeah? Correct. It does not change wrapped categories, correct? Yeah, I see. Yeah. And, uh, and second part, do I understand that you, you, you consider like deformorphism of closed ball? Yeah. Uh, then it's this homotopy type of the thing stabilizes. Stabilizes if you multiply by interval and so on. It will be part of the symmetry group of a point, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And this thing was really calculated by people like Wagner and yeah, it's pure homotopy for K theory of integers and so on. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Uh, but that's right. Um, yes, yeah. exactly. So, so I don't know the connection to like, you know, the pseudo isotopy group in Waldhaus yeah. and stuff. Um, so, yeah, but yeah. It, it, there's clear connections. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think Ezra has a question. Yeah, Ezra has a question. Uh, well, actually, I just wanted, uh, let me start with a remark, which is that the Dwyer Khan localization is defined for small categories. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if the difficulties you were alluding to were because a priori you didn't have a small category or no. a different issue. No, I think everything that I'm working with actually is, is small. I mean, the category oh, okay. of manifolds is, is small. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so that's not, that's, it's not that. What was the problem then? Could I ask you to, you yeah. said that it was difficult to define a... <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it, it, yeah, the, the key is actually very, very, it's geometric, it's not categorical. Mm. Um, again, the, the issue actually is this, this lack of stabilization for these kinds of morphisms. Like from, from history in this geometric context, we know this is the right kind of morphism. Ah. We, we know that stabilizing is the right thing to do, mm. but we can't stabilize morphisms. Um, and if you do, th there is a way to do it making a ton of non-canonical choices. But once you make non-canonical choices of how to stabilize morphisms, then you have to make non-canonical choices of how to compose, etc. So it's, it's just a mess. And uh, the, the solution that we had is also purely geometric. It turns out that the space of these morphisms is homotopy equivalent to a much crazier space of morphisms where the infinity category with those morphisms is easier to define. Mm. So, so it's, the solution is actually more or less purely geometric plus some common infinity categorical tricks that a peddler like myself can pull off. Mm. Yeah, but the, the difficulty is geometric. Mm. Uh, also, I have some kind of small suggestion. May, uh, is it because in the, all the sectors, it's analog of like manifold with a boundary, yeah? Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's also nature considers something like manifolds with corners, or sectors yes. with corners, yeah? Yes. Does yes. it play any role in your story? 100%. 100%. Yeah. Uh, we, we need corners because as soon as you stabilize more than once, you get corners. And you know, and you know, this is kind of a trivial observation. But the fact that um, you know, in the category of in the infinity category of manifolds, uh, these two things are equivalent. They're, they're isotopies. Um, so, so this is also an important fact as well. Oh, is there, is, is that another hand raise, or is that from previous? When, uh, when you glue something from one scan sector, so the uh, gluing procedure. So, I mean, one scan sector is kind of building blocks. Yeah. Uh, so, Jan, I'm sorry. Could could you say your question again? I no, no, no. The, the question is that I, I mean, uh, uh, 
you consider only uh, uh, Weinstein sectors or Weinstein manifolds, uh, and if you are interested in the bio category of the big thing, you this kind of blue in procedure like homotopy unit something and should take care about really um, uh, a pseudo holomorphic disks which sits outside so it's kind of uh, um, it's it's not it does not look as a entirely a categorical kind of this infinity uh, categories formalism so my question is about this invariants uh, if you are interested to build them globally from what you know of Einstein. So, right, so we might, you and I might be talking about different notions of global, but so, so let me just make one comment. It turns out everything I said works for Leoville sectors, not just Weinstein sectors, in case that's one thing you're, you're concerned yeah, about. Yeah. But, yeah. but the second thing is, um, to, so um, the idea of building the invariants themselves, you know, it all begins with, with constructing this functor. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, without at least this, from strict morphisms between Weinsteins into some infinity categories, say like of A infinity categories, um, this is like the bare minimum that you should ask of anybody if they say they have, you know, a modern invariant of Weinstein sectors. And so you're right, I mean, like constructing this, that's not what we did, right? I mean, that's the stuff that, um, you know, people like GPS, I was I Seidel did. Um, so, so yes, like already in the beginning, there's something A infinity categorical about this because strict composition here might be sent to non-strict composition, but only up to homotopy here. I again might be misinterpreting your question, but number three is uh, the co-limit thing that you, you talked about. So um, one of the things that I think you, you can prove, and this is not obvious, it turns out that uh, this thing has finite co-limits. And by the gluing formula of GPS, uh, that actually means that this functor from here to the infinity category of the infinity category is called the wrapped Fukaya, preserves finite co-limits. And so that, that's one way that you can talk about um, you know, the gluing formula. So, so that's not been written, but uh, it, it, it's in progress. It, it, it's, I think it's an amazing result. And now, as you say, if I end complete, I get a functor from end Weinstein sectors to A infinity categories, because that's already incompleted. And in particular, you get all kinds of amazing things, like this all of a sudden has an initial object, even though it didn't before end completing. And the right adjoint to the wrap Fukai category functor, I claim is an incredibly rich and beautiful thing that needs to be studied. Uh, it's, it's clearly something at the heart of all of this, you know, Fukai category business, is understanding the, the formal right adjoint to the end completion of wrapped. Like that just seems like an obvious thing we need to study. So I don't know if I addressed any. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. That, that's, okay. that's, that's mm -hmm. All right. Okay. And thank you. Yeah. And Boris, good yeah, to see you, Boris. Boris. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks. If you could just, you know, clarify a little bit. So in the beginning, you had this language of, you know, local to global and of two. If you could just, you know, connect it a little bit more to, to what you did. Yes, so, yes, absolutely. Um, so, local to global did not appear at all except to motivate the idea of Weinstein sectors. They're, you know, they have structures where you can talk about local to global things, but so let me just say a theorem in progress. So first, uh, this, this thing. So this is just some ridiculous mix of geometry and formal category theory. So you have no handle on it. But the point is that this has all finite coordinates. Uh, and the second, you know, let me just state all the results. And, and the wrapped Fukaya category functor, which now we know, based on the theorem that I presented earlier, goes from this localization to the infinity category of A infinity categories. It preserves finite coordinates. Um, so this statement is local to global. Um, so this is completely orthogonal to everything else I talked about in terms of results today. But this is somehow like the next thing that I want to write up after I write up this stuff is uh, this turns out to have finite coordinates and this and so this is a consequence of uh, actually this is a consequence of I think people call it the Conse it's one of the Kinsevich conjectures, which is now a theorem 
it, it's a theorem of GPS that there's a gluing formula uh, for the Fukaya category. I think this is something that Maxine proposed a long time ago, or maybe not all, you know, when I was a grad student. And so, so Boris, I believe this is where the local to global comes in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. And, and what I was telling, you know, Jan earlier was, now if you incomplete by the adjoint functor theorem, this, you know, preserves all colimits and there's a right adjoint. And I say studying that right adjoint is, is seems incredibly important. I see, I see, yeah. Are there more questions? Yep, seems not. So maybe we can thank Hero again. Okay, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I don't know, do people stick around after the recording is done or is that not a thing? Yeah, can people can stick around. Yeah, I can keep the room running. Yeah, well, if, if anybody wants.